Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and start our last class on the means of growth. And I want to do similar to what we've been doing, and then it's just we'll start with our key passage and then kind of work it out from there. So again, just a quick review, means of growth. I'm just putting my spin on the whole concept of the means of grace, which has been the, uh, the historical understanding of how God works with his church, how God works with his people, how God pour, pours out his grace upon his people. And we're using Acts chapter 2. You can turn there. We'll start there. Acts chapter 2 is kind of the uh, foundational key passage from which we were drawing out these instruments, these means. We talked about how you can kind of summarize the two. You can summarize these means maybe in the two big pictures of the Word and the sacraments and some... Um, some uh, pastors will do that. Some theologians will do that, and and that and that's fine. And obviously, you know, you can wor work your way from there. Uh, we're using Acts chapter two, breaking it up into these four means, which I think is more common today. What what you'll hear, and like I said, it from the beginning, prayer. We're skipping that just because the last class was all about prayer. So we talked about. The Apostles' teaching, the last time we talked about fellowship, and today we'll end our discussion on the breaking of bread. Let me read Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they were continually devoting themselves to the Apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Let me pray, since we uh, don't have the singing today, I feel like I need to pray to just kind of officially kick us off, I guess, and then we'll start. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be back uh, this evening, this afternoon. We can be back to, to learn, to grow, to meditate upon your truth, to uh, discuss your truth. Uh, I pray that you would bless this time as we... Up here, up here, as we talk about uh, the the means of grace and the means of communion and the Lord's Supper, we ask that you bless the time that the kids will have down there and all the um, teaching and discussion and all the communion that that will take place there. Uh, Lord, may may you edify us right now, Holy Spirit, through your Word. Amen. Okay, so I'm calling this the means of the meal, and um, obviously Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that stems from this whole idea of the breaking of bread, and that's what we're focused on, the breaking of bread and the prayers. And again, not to get too technical, but grammatically the way this phrase is written is kind of interesting because the definite article appears with both of these. So it's to the breaking of bread and to the prayers, which suggests that there's a specific activity that it's being referred to. It's not just like a, a generic, you know, and they just ate together and, and that's it. Uh, it suggests that there's something specific that's being referred to there. And and the, the prayers too, which again, we're not really getting getting into, but... That's uh, obviously something important, too, when, when we're talking about the communal gathering of the saints, the, the gathering of the church. The word that's used here for the breaking of bread is only used twice in the New Testament, and the, uh, obviously it's used here, and then the only other time that it's used, the, the noun form of this uh, word, is in Luke 24, and the interesting part about Luke 24 is that's the road to Emmaus. So that's that famous chapter that deals with after Jesus is resurrected, but he's still on the earth. He's still here with his disciples, and he kind of comes and goes. 
He has that, you know, 40-day interesting time of where he kind of comes and goes, and there's fellowship, and then he'll appear, and then he'll disappear, and, uh, and then he appears finally, for he, he has his fellowship, uh, and, and then he's ascended. But the road to Emmaus is interesting because he meets two of the apostles, two of the disciples, and then in verse 35 it says, this is at the end of their meeting, and uh, excuse me, actually verse 35 is when they went and told the other disciples, but I'll read this because it summarizes and then we'll look back. And they were relating their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. And the event that they're referring to is from verse 30. And it happened that when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and after breaking it, he was giving it to them. Now, hopefully what's, what's going through your mind is you have the disciples that are walking with this man who gives them the greatest hermeneutical lesson on how to understand the Old Testament, Luke 24 is phenomenal because it helps us to understand how we are to properly read the Old Testament. And then he sits down and has a meal with them, and it was specifically at the time of him breaking the bread and giving it to them and giving, it thank, and giving thanks for that bread that their eyes are open. What would they have remembered? They would have remembered that last Passover meal, right? It would have taken their minds right back to the Passover meal when Jesus ushered in the new covenant, he broke the bread, he poured the wine, and that's exactly what they would have remembered from there. And this is the exact word that's being used here in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and I think it's also, and I think the relevance there is that it's describing the same, the same event that the early church then began to practice. They would have looked back to the model that Jesus had instituted, and they would have remembered the fact that he said, do this in remembrance of me. And then that's what they would have picked up. So I think what's referring to here with the breaking of the bread is specifically the Lord's Supper. It's talking about communion. It's talking about, historically, it's been referred to as the Eucharist, and I really like that term, and I don't like the fact that the Roman Catholics stole it, and I think we should take it back, because it stems from the Greek term to give thanks, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're giving thanks. It is a time of when we feast upon our Lord and we give thanks. So I'm going to use those terms interchangeably, communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, I'll, but they're all, again, referring to specifically that time of which we're all familiar with, and that is the Lord's Supper. Now, there is an aspect of this also, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 46, the verb, ter the, the verb form of this term is actually used in verse 46, and daily devoting themselves with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. You see, there's a difference, though, that's used there. One is specifically referring to just a casual, private aspect of meals and breaking bread, and the other one is something that's phrased in the context of the communal gathering of the saints in, in, in verse 42. So the corporate aspect is what we're focusing on, the corporate aspect of when the people of God gather they feast upon Christ through communion, through the Lord's Supper. But there is also, again, in verse 46, there's obviously an aspect, and I would say that looks more to the whole idea of fellowship um, uh, there in, in verse 46. And just a little bit of the historical context here, they probably met in the courtyard of the Gentiles, so they obviously met in the temple uh, the court of the Gentiles would have been the out, outer kind of uh, uh, layer, if we can put it that way, uh, section of the temple. And when everyone was gathered there, it, 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 uh, some sources say that it could, there could be as many as 200,000 people that could fit there. So we're talking pretty big area. So 3,000 people getting saved, meeting 
wasn't something that was like, you know, necessarily mind blowing because it was, it was a very active place. There was a lot going on in, in that place at that temple. And obviously there would have been, so they met continually, it says, and they were continually devoted to these things. So probably what happened was they would gather in the temple uh, and then they would go back and have their, live their lives, have time of fellowship, and they would come back and gather in the temple. And obviously they were Jews. All they knew was the Jewish religion. So there probably was a lot of Jewish carryover in, 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 in terms of how they conducted that service, but they would have remembered everything that Christ would have taught them. And then this is where we have to be careful with the book of Acts, because the book of Acts, I think, is the story of the Holy Spirit working through the apostles to teach them all things the way that Jesus promised, and we'll look at some of those passages. Now, the early Jewish practice of the meal with the Lord's Supper um, was something that, again, there was, I think, a lot of carryover from the, from the Jewish tradition, but then they would have been faithful to what the Lord laid down in, in uh, the last Passover, but a lot of their, what the practice became, a lot of it was centered, maybe you heard it, it, uh, of it, it was uh, through the agape meals. So when they, when they did the Lord's Supper, it was, it was an actual, uh, it, it would have been in the context of a meal, and um, a lot of churches actually, some of the uh, early church, uh, church fathers write about this, that it was a separate service. So they would actually have two separate services. They would have a main service that everybody would come, and then after that they would have a separate service where only the, the members would be part of, and that's where... Uh, the, the Lord's Supper uh, would, would be conducted. And again, there's a historical context there, and we're not going to get into too much of that. So our focus today is on the Lord's Supper or on the, the Eucharist. Now, we could broaden that to sacraments in general, that the Lord uses sacraments to pour out His grace upon His people, and baptism, obviously, would, would fall under that. The, the church has historically recognized baptism as a sacrament of the church. But there is a difference between the two. Obviously, one is done once. You don't keep getting rebaptized every week or once a month or whatever. The other one is something that is continually done. And it's actually really interesting. <laughs> I remember at Lancaster Bible College, I had to write a paper on Justin Martyr's view of baptism. Justin Martyr was an early church father, and, um, and it's freaky because a church historian was my professor, so it's always freaky when you're writing a paper on church history and you know, your professor, is a, that, that is, that's his specialty. But the, the, the focus of the paper was, does the early church, and specifically Justin Martyr, believe in uh, baptismal regeneration? D d d did he believe that you have to be baptized to be saved? And it's, it, it's a very difficult question to answer because when, when you read Acts, you read the early church fathers, you read the early church, they placed baptism very closely with the time of your salvation. Because they viewed baptism as something that is important and crucial as, as a, a, of a step that you need to take. If you are professing to be in Christ, then you need to publicly make that profession. And we see that in, in Acts. I mean, right before this passage in verse 42, Paul or P Peter uh, says, repent and each of you be baptized. It, it's almost like to him, it's just, one and the other. There, there's no, it, it, you, you get baptized. If you're repenting and you're following Christ, you get baptized. So it, it was an interesting, uh, it, it was an interesting uh, study, but, but I think there is a difference because baptism is obviously something that, that happens once. The Lord's Supper is something that you continually do. 
So there's something special and unique about the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, the sacrament of this breaking of the bread, that Jesus specifically said, do this continually. Do this as you remember me. Do this on a consistent basis. And that's why the focus of when we talk about the means of grace, the means of growth, we're talking about the, the, those aspects, those instruments of our Christian corporate life that we do continually. Baptism, again, plays a huge important role in that, but that's in the beginning. And, 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 and there's a grace aspect there that comes from the obedience. So, but our focus is on the Lord's Supper today. Just uh, very quickly, there are four main views on the Lord's Supper and uh, the reason why I mention this, because I think it's important to the view that I think is most biblical, I think it most aligns with this whole concept of the means of grace, that God uses it as a form of our, of our growth. Uh, the first view is transubstantiation, and that's the Roman Catholic view. That's a heretical view uh, for, for, for many, many reasons, but... Uh, the main one is because they, so they pretty much believe that, that the elements themselves, they, they are, tra once the priest prays over them, the, they transform into the, the, the actual body and the blood of Christ. So, uh, so Roman Catholics, every time the mass is done, they are actually re-sacrificing Christ. It, it's, it has huge, huge uh, issues and implications. Um, uh, consubstantiation was the Lutheran view. That's what Martin Luther adopted during, uh, at the time of the Reformation, and that's what L Lutherans adopt today. And it's a step in the right direction, but it still has issues. The, the con there is the whole idea of with or together. So Martin Luther believed that uh, Jesus is present in and around the elements. He's, he's everywhere and he's around the elements, but obviously the elements don't physically turn, uh, aren't turned into the body and, and the blood of Christ. And there, I, I think there's problems there. His biggest opponent of that was Zwingli. And if you read Luther and Zwingli, um, this was such a contention between them that Luther pretty much said, I, I don't want anything to do with you. Like over this issue alone. Like, it, it's, it's quite interesting when you read just the reformers and how, how strict they were on certain things. But Zwingli argued for what's uh, referred to as the memorial view. Uh, and that's very common amongst um, uh, just mainstream evangelicals, just evangelicals, mainstream Baptists uh, to this day where uh, it would be just a memorial where what happens is it, 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 we're simply just remembering Christ it's just an aspect of the service. There's nothing necessarily special about it, uh, and, and that's it. And uh, like I said, Zwingli and Luther went at it pr pretty heavily. They, had, they met over it once, had a uh, big debate, and then Luther pretty much wrote, wrote him off, which was kind of funny. But um, Calvin comes around then after. He's kind of like a, sec he, a second-generation reformer. He introduces uh, what, he, he looks at kind of, obviously, the Roman Catholic position. He looks at what Luther does, what Zwingli does, and he introduces what's been named the real presence view. And, and this is the one that I think is most faithful to, to Scripture. And it's been referred to as the Reformed view. Uh, uh, and it's very common amongst Presbyterians, Reformed Baptists, more in the Reformed crowd. Usually people will look to Calvin uh, when they uh, try to describe the Lord's Supper. And pretty much what, the, what this view says is, because Calvin, Calvin looked at the different positions, he looked at Scripture, and he says, well, obviously the elements don't physically change their substance. And he didn't like Luther's view because uh, for certain reasons we'll, we'll, uh, we'll mention in a little bit. Uh, he also didn't like Zwingli's view because he, he thought, he's like, it doesn't, it, it seems too dry. It, it's, it's, it's simply too dry to look at uh, the Lord's Supper as just a memorial event and, and that's it. So he, he said that um, 
Christ, Christ does not come down from heaven during the Lord's Supper. Where in transubstantiation, consubstantiation, he, he would have to come down from heaven. What, what, obviously, you know, in transubstantiation, it would be a, almost a, a, a physical coming down. Um, in, in consubstantiation, it's a spiritual kind of c- coming down f- from heaven. But, but uh, Calvin said, Christ does not come down, but he is present in a special way through the Spirit. So Calvin was trying to look at, okay, what does Scripture say on how Jesus communicates with his people, with his church today? And he said, when you read Scripture, it's through the Spirit that Christ communicates with his people. So let let me try to summarize it in a form of an argument. The Lord's Supper is more than simply a a, a symbolic event of remembrance. So it's more than simply we just remember the death of Jesus. For it is an instrument of special corporate worship where Christ communes with us through the Spirit, but it does not bring Christ down from his throne as if he needed to accomplish this work again. And where... Uh, where Calvin's, and again, I, I would, if you're interested in, in looking at this more, I think Calvin's in his Institutes of Religion, he has a section uh, talking about this. I think he does a great job. It's, it's a hard read. Uh, I mean, he lived, you know, quite a while ago. Um, it, it's a hard read, but, but, but it's very edifying. It's very good to try to understand what, what are we doing when we, when we come up to take the elements. So, Christ has ascended to heaven at the end of his life. Remember, we talked about he's resurrected. He spends his time with with, uh, appearing and disappearing uh, with with the apostles. And then he is ascended into heaven. And he ascends there as the God-man. And he remains as the God-man. And he is continuing his work specifically of intercession as our mediator he continues his work as the high priest he is interceding on behalf of his people but he but the work of his sacrifice is done and complete and and that's why obviously the roman catholic view is is heretical and 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 has a lot of issues so and i think that's the main reason why why the, the real presence view it is, it is very important and, and why, um, why I think it's most helpful to view it that way because viewing the, the, uh, the Eucharist this way, specifically as the real presence of Christ, it, it gives it the, the real power of an ongoing sacrament which is used then by the Lord, by God, to bestow grace upon his people. And I think the memorial view, and again, I'm not going to be a a Lutheran Zwingli here, um, and if you hold to the memorial view, it's fine. Um, but, But I think the memorial view loses some of that. It loses some of that aspect of specifically the the means by which God communes or Christ communes with his people. And we'll look at a couple passages to to try to try to demonstrate this. So the one passage I want to focus on is John chapter 6. If you turn to John 6, I think it's probably one of my favorite passages in the Bible because there's so much here and There's a lot here that helps us to understand how God works with his people. So quickly, verses 1 through 14, you have the feeding of the 5,000. And then starting in um, verse 26, you have the bread narrative. So that's, that's the whole narrative of Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, and it begins by the people that saw the, the, the people that were fed, that who were part of the 5,000, they come back the next day and Jesus rebukes them and says, well, the only reason why you're back is because all you really want is bread. 
and then he turns that into a, a teaching lesson. And he said, you, you missed the point. You missed the point because the real bread that you want is me. I am the bread of life. You think, you're, you're happy that you got your, your loaves. You're happy that you got your loaves, but you missed the point of what I was trying to demonstrate and what I was trying to do. So verse, starting with verse 26, he begins this narrative of referring to himself as the bread of life. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. And then verse, with verse 36, he looks, at, he looks at the people that do not believe, and he says, yet you do not believe. And then verse 37, he gives the reason of why they don't believe. Well, the reason that they don't believe is because the Father has not given them to the Son. But the ones who are given to the Son, the ones whom the Father does give, to the Son, the end result and the extent of the work of Christ is summarized in this phrase, which appears over and over again in this chapter of, I will raise them up on the last day, raise it up on the last day. So there's beautiful unity that's seen there of between the work of the Father, between the work of the Son, and then the work of the Spirit, which we'll, we'll, we'll see comes out a little bit later there. But all of that work has the same purpose. The Father draws the people to Himself. The Father gives them to the Son. The Son then does not cast them out. The Son becomes the bread of life for them. And because He is the bread of life, that life is eternal and they will be raised with Him at the end on the last day. And then the narrative continues. I'm, I'm kind of jumping through here. Uh, verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Now, the immediate context of this whole terminology that's used here of feasting upon Christ, we'll look at at the end there, is fulfilled in the, in the two words of and the actions of coming to Christ and believing in Christ. Because Roman Catholics will use this passage to argue for their view of the Lord's Supper, but what they miss completely is the fact that th this is, Jesus is using symbolic, re real language, but, he is, but he's using sim uh, symbolic language to try to get them to see the whole aspect of what it means to come to Christ. So, so the whole idea of feasting upon Christ, and then specifically, verse 54, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. That's fulfilled in the immediate context of coming and believing in Christ. So, so I think that's important for us to understand, but that being said, I think the, the symbolism can be carried over into the real meaning of the Lord's Supper. So the Lord's Supper looks back to what Christ did. It looks back to the death of Christ. And, it, and because it looks back, it looks back to the whole concept of us believing and coming to Christ, but then the result of that is us abiding in Christ. So verse 56, it says, let me start with 55, for my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink, and then 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So again, we're he is specifically referring to the whole concept of believing on him and coming to him, but he is using the terminology of the new covenant, which, it, which we see in the Lord's Supper. So, so I think the Lord's Supper, there's something unique and something special about the Lord's Supper. When we gather together, we are reminded of our coming and believing in Christ and then Christ uses that to abide with us. 
And this whole, con- this whole phrase of abiding in me, I think, is, is very important here because it's picked up in, in John, and this is where we can look to some passages because we can ask the question, well, how does Christ abide with us? How, how do we abide with, with Christ? And this is where, again, John Calvin looks at and says that this is where the Spirit comes in. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in because it is through the Spirit and the ministry of the Spirit that we abide in Christ. So we can look at passages like John 14, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate that he may be with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Verses 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And then in chapter 15, again, the, the beginning verses pick up this whole theme of abiding and what it means to, to abide in Christ. And then in verse 20, 26, he says, when the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you will bear witness also, because you have been with me from the beginning." And then another passage in in chapter 16, verse 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak for himself, but whatever he, he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Again, looking at this aspect of the work of the Spirit. And then in Romans chapter 8, which is a, a, a very powerful chapter when it comes to the work of the Spirit, we see a lot of this emphasized I'll just read a couple verses, starting with verse 10. But if Christ is in you through the body, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Jumping down to verse 14. For as many as are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of, a, a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children also heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. So obviously a lot of those passages are describing the work of the spirit in a generic sense in terms of our everyday life the the work but if you walk back from there to John 6 I I think there there's an argument there that can be made which which puts the Lord's supper as a unique time where we come, we corporately come and we feast upon Christ. And the, through the Spirit, Christ manifests to Himself to us in a special and unique way. And I think that's that in John 6, when Jesus is referring to this whole idea of when you come to me, when you believe in me, you are feasting upon me. You're feasting upon my body. And he specifically uses the same, the same elements, the same symbolism that then he picks up in instituting the new covenant, in instituting the Lord's Supper. So I, I, I know there's a lot there and it demands a lot to just sit through and think through. And again, I would just recommend John Calvin's um, Institutes of Religion there because I think it's helpful. But 
to, to just summarize that, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to demonstrate is that I, I, we have to view the Lord's Supper as something more than just simply a, an event of where I thought about the death of Christ. Okay, great. It's cool. Um, and and, I, and I, I don't mean to minimize the memorial view to that. I, I, I'm being a, a, little, a little silly there. But, but, I do, but, but I think it's much helpful if, you, if we view the Lord's Supper as a special and a unique time where the Lord uses that through the Spirit to make himself known to us in a real and special and unique way that when we come forward and we take those elements, we are truly feasting upon Christ. We are feasting upon his work. We're feasting upon everything that, that he did and everything that he is currently doing as being our uh, mediator and our intercessor. And, and, and there's a lot of blessings that then come based upon that. In another passage we can look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. This is in the context of idolatry and, and, and the mixing of different worships. But Paul says, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Where again, Paul elevates the language that he uses there is more than just simply the language of you just with your mind you remember the death of Christ. You are participating and sharing with Christ and communing with Christ. And I think the the passages that we looked at uh, 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 clearly demonstrate that that is done through the work of the Spirit. And then when you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he doesn't specifically emphasize this in this chapter. He, he just gives the command of, of what you are to do and how you are to do it. But in verse 26, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. So, I think this is, a pro, this is a proclamation of allegiance, of who we belong to. I think there's also a proclamation of communion that takes place here, based upon, again, chapter 10 and some of the other passages that we looked at, that you are coming forward and you are communing with Christ. You are participating in something where Christ is revealing himself to you through the Spirit in a special and unique way. And that's why it is a time that we need to rejoice in participating in and we need to long for. And it is a time that I think the, the, the New Testament argues that you do it when you come together. As you gather, when you come together as the people of God, you feast upon your Savior. You feast upon the body of Christ through the Spirit, the fellowship of the Spirit, through the work of the Spirit. It's a proclamation of worship also that takes place here. So I'll end with what are the blessings of the grace of communion? Well, I think the analogy of the physical bread and wine make that clear, right? So what does bread do to our physical body? Obviously, it nourishes us. It provides the necessary nourishment. So when we come forward and we partake of this meal, when we feast upon our Lord, it provides nourishment upon us in a special and unique way. And it does that to the point of where when you do it improperly, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, it will impact your health. Isn't that interesting? The analogy is bread, and it's done in the context of a spiritual reality, but if you do it improperly, it's as if you didn't receive the proper physical nourishment, and, and it causes you to be sick and some even to die. 
which I think is extremely interesting that that's the context in which Paul places all of this in, the context of discernment, which we'll talk about next. And then, obviously, wine. What does wine do? Well, I mean, I know that there's, if you choose not to drink alcohol, that's perfectly fine. But wine, we can say in its proper context, it brings gladness. Right? When you, when you have a cup of wine with, with uh, or glass, you can't say cup, right? I'm, we don't have fancy wine glasses, so. You know. um, when you have a glass of wine with dinner, it's a time of, it, it, it's something that brings in a, a unique and special aspect to that dinner. If you go out to a restaurant, maybe, you know, maybe that's that one time in whatever, once a month or whatever, and you have a glass of wine. It's something unique. It's something special. It brings in gladness to the heart. And obviously, we need to be careful that we don't abuse it so it doesn't lead into drunkenness or anything further. But that also is the same analogy that applies to the spiritual aspect of the Lord's Supper. When we come forward to feast upon the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, we feed, we, we pour, there is a spiritual gladness that Christ pours out upon us through His grace that we get because we participate in the meal of the Lord. And again, if we don't do it properly, what does it do? As Paul says, some of you get sick and some of you even die. And this gets us to the next blessing, and that is the whole aspect of discerning. Remember, we talked about this a, a, a couple Sundays ago, how Paul uses two different terms here in 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, some translations, so my translation translates both of it as judge, but there's actually two different words that are used there. Uh, the word for actual judge, as, as judgment, is used of the actions of God. And then the word that is used of the actions of man is, uh, I, uh, I think, better understood as discernment. So, verse 28, But a man must test himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge or discern the body rightly. For this reason many... Excuse me, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged or discern ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. And that's the other term, that's the action of God. But when we are judged, that's the actual term for judge, the action of God, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So this is how seriously God takes the Lord's Supper. This is how seriously he takes that if you are not properly discerning what, and I think there, there's a lot, there, there's two aspects, I think, to that. One is obviously the, the general aspect of are you a believer? Are you walking with the, Lord, with the Lord? Are you walking and consistent with your profession? And then I think the other aspect is just also where is your mind at the time that the Lord's Supper has taken place? You know, so I think there is a real aspect of are you just thinking about the game that you're going to go watch after the service? Because if that's where your mind is and you're just doing a, you know, a, a numbless kind of walk up, grab the bread and, and grab the wine, then you are not properly discerning the body and blood of Christ. Because you are not understanding what's actually taking place. You are not properly understanding that this is a means by which, you are, by which Christ chooses to show himself, reveal himself to you, and you get to feast upon Christ through the Spirit. They are physical elements. But for some reason, in his sovereignty, God chose those physical elements to, to present something special and unique at that time when we corporately gather and we partake of those elements. 
to the point of where, again, if we are not discerning, and this is, again, uh, this is a blessing because confession is a good thing. So think about that. Every Sunday we have something that reminds us of the seriousness of our sin, the seriousness of, uh, of our need for forgiveness and repentance, the seriousness of our need to just dwell upon our lives and seek the Lord to, to search our hearts, the, 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 the seriousness of us to discern what Christ has done and if it's real in our lives, that's a blessing. That's a good thing. We can every, at this church we do it every Sunday, but on a consistent basis. Let me just say in passing, there was a, um, there, there's a, a really good uh, Presbyterian preacher, Richard Phillips. He, he uh, a conference that uh, Vivian and I used to go to fairly consistently in Philadelphia. He was the, the main guy there. But I remember I was talking to him um, a- after one of the talks, and he was telling me about how he went to Canada, and there's a group of uh, just strict Dutch Reformed guys, the churches, and they would, because they were so strict and so rigid in how they, they did everything, they would do communion once a year and nobody would come forward because they were all too terrified of whether they're, they're in the right state to participate. And he was just like, he pretty much rebuked them for it. Because he's like, you're completely missing the point of what communion is. <laughs> the, the whole point of communion is you're not worthy. And this is what makes you worthy. The work of Christ is what makes you worthy. So, so there's a great blessing there. And that story just stuck with me because it, it just demonstrates, again, um, the fine line between we have to make sure and discern that we're walking with the Lord, that we are, that our profession is true. But communion is for the brokenhearted. It is for the sinner. Because that is where Christ meets you. If you are one of His, that's where Christ meets you. And that's where you get to discern properly upon His work and how that work affects you. So it's a means of grace. There's great blessing in that. Another thing is it increases our heart of thankfulness. Right? There's a reason why the early church called this the Eucharist. They refer to it as the Eucharist because it is a time of thanksgiving. It is a time of where we meditate upon the work of Christ, we feast upon Christ, and we give thanks. And it elevates our heart of thankfulness. And we do it consistently and continually. So it's, it's something that's good because it's something that we can think about, uh, about. So it's an ongoing corporal, uh, corporate. I wrote corporal. I don't think that's actually right. Corporate means of our abiding with Christ. So again, I take us back to John 6 and this whole concept of abiding with Christ, feasting upon Christ, this whole theme of abiding. I think the Lord's Supper is a special and unique time that God has chosen for the church to to do when when the church gathers publicly And it is that instrument, it is one of the instruments by which Christ meets with his people in a special and unique way through the Spirit, through the work of the Spirit. And when we come forward, it is an aspect of us abiding in Christ. There's something unique and something special that takes place there. And it's something that God uses to grow us and mature us and to draw us closer to Him. So we will end there, and that concludes our class, and we can open it up for time of questions or comments. It can be upon what we talked about today or what we talked about uh, previously.
and um, Keith taught the class on prayer, so prayer, you can just, you can probably summarize it in five minutes for us, right? As, I'm just kidding, but go ahead. I, I always use communion as a corporate thing, but I know people that do it privately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I remember wrestling through this a few years ago because we got into this conversation. We had, there was family that we met in North Carolina and became really good friends with them and we're sitting around the bonfire and we're like, why don't we do communion right now? Like, why not? We're gathered, you know, we got together, we're gathering, we're all believers. Um, I, wrestling through it, I think it's improper to take a means that was designed for the corporate gathering of, of, of the saints and just use it in private settings. So I don't want to be too strict with that because I know that, again, what's your context? Are you in a context of persecution? Or, you know, are you kind of house churches? Are you So I think context will depend on that. But if you're in a context where you have a gathering that you attend and, and, and you're part of a church, I think that's where it should be done, because I think that's where it was, that's what it was designed for, and I think Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 makes that clear. It's when you gather, when you gather for, for this meal, and again, Acts 2, I think, demonstrates that also. So, but, you know, it, I'm not going to be super dogmatic on that, but I do think it's done in the corporate gathering. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think it excludes it. maybe an elder or someone that's pastor or elder, but I've never felt comfortable in that aspect. Anybody can serve it. And even that, that brings up another question. I, ne- I never felt comfortable with a, a non ordained or at least, just, I, just take the word anyway you want, either ministry or sacrament. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, we're partly entering into territory that's scripture is not overly clear on. So I think there's there's going to be some disagreements on that. I would tend to agree with you. I, I do think that when we're talking about the realm of the church and the aspects of our lives that God has given for for the church to conduct, I think it should be conducted by individuals who oversee that institution. So I'm not crazy about um, like fathers, for example, being like, I want to baptize my child. I I mean, is it wrong? Is it sinful? No, I, I can't say it's wrong and it's sinful. But I think you're kind of disrespecting the authority of the church by doing that because there's a reason why God gave pastors and elders to, to the church. Now, again, if you're in a context where you're in persecution or you just started the church, and it's, it, it, again, there's a lot of, I think, grace that can be given there. And I mean, I know, you know, in seminaries, there, there were conversations we had and people were like, well, I mean, there's literally environments where the gospel comes into a tribe and the godliest person there is, is a woman. And they were like, well, can she preach? You know, so you're like, you're trying to figure that out because there's no man that's actually qualified and able to do it. So, so you're trying to figure that out. So, so again, are, th- there's those situations. There's those contexts. But I think ideally the goal of where we're going, where a church should go, I would tend to agree with you. I mean, we should respect the, the institution of the church just like we do in the home. We, we respect the institution of, of the role that the, the father plays, the role that the mother plays, the role that the, the husband plays and, and the wife plays, and, and we, don't mi- we don't mix those unless there are circumstances that demand that. That, that you know, if, if it's a single mom situation, then obviously the single mom's going to pick up the, 
the aspect of, of being the head of the household, because she has to. But we don't use that to necessarily change the rule, if that helps at all. Well, that settles it then. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, th that would be a unique situation. So ideally, hopefully in that situation, they're part of a church where elders and, and people from the church can come and, and do that with them. Um, but if, again, if, if, if that's not possible, if for whatever reason people can't come to the church, from the church, sure, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it would be sinful. I don't think it would be wrong. As long as you're, again, respecting the church, you're respecting the, the institution and the authority of the church, and you're trying to honor that and abide by that. Keith, you got one more. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I'm not fully following. Well, so, so you're you you. Um, no, I don't think that's overreach. I, I would say, I mean, y you obviously have a lot more experience than I do in, in that area. Um, but m my understanding of, again, the role that a pastor and an elder would play in that situation would be to fence the table. And, and I would say in that situation, you go beyond even simply fencing the table you, you would, you would um, confront their sin, and, and in that confrontation, you bring in the seriousness of, of that sin. So the reason you fence the table, and see, and, the, and this is where it gets so difficult, because it's not like, okay, well, you can live together until you get married, you have a date planned, right? Okay, good. So don't, don't partake of the table, but then once you get married, okay, now you can start partaking. Like, obviously, we know that's not the real issue because the issue is not simply just fixing that, that situation. The issue is you're living in sin, and, and you need to go before your God that you profess 
to, to, to be serving, and you need to seek his will on what does it mean for you to be faithful. And until you're willing to do that, you can't participate in the church and receive the blessings of the church in the way that the other Christians are. So, which obviously might lead to bigger consequences. And that, that's, you know, that, that, that's a whole nother route there. But, but yeah, I do think the Lord's Supper, because it, and this is the beauty of coming forward for the Lord's Supper, because think about it. So for so long, many, many churches today, they, they just do it in the seat. Well, there's no accountability there. There's something about you coming forward and then others in the church see, hey, hey, that brother ha- is not coming forward. And okay, it happened once. Oh, now it's happening twice. Oh, hey, it's happening three times. Like, what's going on? So there's an accountability there that the church has to where you can then go up to those people and be like, hey, what's going on? So then, obviously, it could be that the elders told you not to come forward because they're fencing the table. So now you have the whole church calling them to repentance. Um, that, and that's called good shame, good and biblical shame. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of angles there, but, but no, I, I, I mean, I don't, I think you would be unfaithful as an elder if you don't do that. Now, there's obviously wisdom in how to do it best and when to do it and all of that. There's wisdom in that, and that's why I think plurality of elders is the best setup because God brings in different people to, to help each other in that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's where again the, the there is I, I mean not not as much my generation, the millennial generation, but the Gen Z generation, like, there is a lot of people in that generation that have grown up and have never heard that it is wrong to sleep together before marriage. Like, they've never even heard that. Like, to them, it's just like, what do you mean? That's just what we do. It's normal. We're boyfriend, girlfriend. <laughs> and when you come up, so there is a, a real legitimate, absolutely, time of where you, you, you might need to counsel them to understand what, what is God's will on, on their life. And their reaction to that will demonstrate where their heart is where their heart is in terms of in their relationship to to God. But that's kind of baffling to think about. Again, for me, I grew up in the church. I grew up in a Christian moral home. You know, so for me to even like think that there's literally people out there that have never that have never even heard that is just like, what planet do you live on? <laughs> um, planet of modern America. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you.